evening to all of you the great viewers who is watching this great show of pinnacle of coronary intervention uh, calcium masterclass uh, i am ehsan raza on behalf of transluminar and shockwave i will be welcome you all to a great great academic feast of calcium masterclass but before we have this session going on i take this opportunity to have a small sneak peek into what does the organization stand for and what it does um, for patients uh, just to give you an information translumina is basically a company with a humble beginning about 10 20 years back with now almost presence in 50 countries and with some of the finest of datas and some of the great strategic partnership with some of the finest companies of this world especially shockwave which helps which has really helped and helped democratize the treatment of managing calcium and it has really opened up a, a great great advantage of treating patients of those of, of those uh, subset of uh, disease at the same time we as a company have uh, the only company in the world today to have drug eluting stent in both polymer and a polymer free strategy in both the strategy we have an only company to have 10 years of an rct data we have a great collaboration so with rnd with german heart center and we have almost now with 1 million implants it um, and 1 million patients happy patients with our products today's evening coming to today it's a great academic feast which is what we called a series of calcium master class and we had been doing for last four to five patient and happy to share that it almost catches about 400 to 1200 eyeballs every month when a doctors of your uh, attend this meeting and and today to take this session we have a great great um academic uh, uh, persons lined up for this evening as the chair as, as a moderator and at the same time the speaker and the panelist but let me have the opportunity today to introduce uh, the 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 moderator of the evening who will take this session forward dr nk mahesh sir who is is a chief cardiologist at st gregorius hospital sir brings a great myriad of experience from defense and command hospital at the same time he has his contribution toward the field of intervention cardiology has been immense so over to you dr mahesh sir to talk to introduce the speaker and the chair of the evening and take this evening forward and make a memorable one for all the people who would be joining this evening sir over to you sir thank you thank you azan uh, i take this opportunity to welcome professor christian templin he is the head and director of the grunting cath lab at university hospital zurich uh, editorial board member of the european heart journal cardiology journal and stem cell discovery he is also the reviewer of 30 peer reviewed journals including lancet jack european heart journal circulation and european journal of heart failure to name a few now i know where my articles are going they're getting destroyed uh, the second Uh, the second chairperson for the evening is Dr. P. L. N. Kaparthi, the senior interventional cardiologist at Care Hospital, Hyderabad. His expertise is complex coronary interventions, transradial interventions, interventions on chronic total occlusions, and intravascular ultrasound guided interventions. The third chairperson is the shining star. He does things that nobody else can do, and uh, every every week he comes out with something that he does, with which we only think after he has done. Uh, Dr. P. K. Hazra, fabulous interventional cardiologist. I watch a lot for him. I really follow him for his uh, for his fabulous cases that he posts quite frequently. Uh, he's an interventional cardiologist, AMRI Hospital, Calcutta. He's when he says he's an expert in TAVR and wireless pacemaker implantation and wireless ICD, artificial heart implantation, varicose vein ablation. The the spectrum is fabulous and phenomenal. I, I welcome you all to today evening's meeting, and I hope that we. Uh, probably my defense background, so we will stick to time and we'll go by the time. So let us start with Professor Christian Templin. Uh, the time doesn't apply to you. You are our guest of honor. Please, you're all yours, sir. Can you hear me? We can hear you, sir. Yes, Perfect. sir. So, dear colleagues, dear participants of the Calcio Masterclass, many thanks for the kind introduction. It's a pleasure for me to be invited to this Indian webinar and to give a presentation about the evidence of coronary intravascular lithotripsy and to share with you our own experience of shockwave therapy for calcified lesions. These are my disclosures. 
So the topics of my presentation are as follows. I will start with a short introduction of the first coronary intervention worldwide performed here at the University Hospital in Zurich. Then we'll talk about different aspects of the disrupt CAD pooled OCT analysis and about the gender analysis from the disrupt CAD pooled study. Finally, I will present two cases of IVL performed in our laboratories. Andreas Grunzig was born in 1939 in Dresden, Germany. He studied medicine in Heidelberg and later on he moved to Zurich and started his research on peripheral interventions and later on also on coronary interventions. On this slide, you can see the first balloon catheters which he and his assistant, Maria Schlumpf, have been produced on the kitchen table in his flat. On the right-hand side, the US patent of the balloon catheter is shown. And after first successful experiments in dogs and pigs, he was searching for a good candidate for the first angioplasty in humans. And this was the first coronary intervention performed on September 16, 1977. After it was done, uh, really sensed that Andreas was very much relieved because he knew himself that this was going to be a real breakthrough. And if it had failed, that would have set him back for a long, long time. Andreas Grunzig had hoped that through his development of balloon angioplasty, 15% of patients would not need bypass surgery. He was completely wrong because nowadays the ratio is exactly the other way around. The success of PCI and especially of complex interventions was possible because of the development of coronary stents, but also of other devices which help us during our procedures. And one of the latest development was for sure the IVL, shockwave therapy. Now I would like to draw your attention to the disrupt CAD pooled OCT analysis. OCT analysis comprises 262 patients pooled from the CAD1 to the CAD4 study. OCT Core Lab was the Cardiovascular Research Foundation in New York, and target lesions were severely calcified de novo lesions. Baseline and lesion characteristics are shown here. The age of the patient was 72, 77% were male, and there was a typical cardiovascular risk profile. Lesion length was 25 millimeters, and the calcified length 32 millimeters, 42 millimeters. Predilatation was performed in 34%, 1.4 IVL catheters have been used, and 87 pulses were delivered. Post IVL dilatation was performed in only 9%, and post stent dilatation in 96% of patients. MLA was 2.1 square millimeters pre-IVL and 6.2 square millimeters post-stent implantation. MSA was 6 square millimeters and mean stent area 7.9 square millimeters post-stenting, resulting in a stent expansion at the maximum calcium site of 103%. Visible calcium fracture were observed in 68% with an average of 3.2 fractures per lesion. Interestingly, the microfracture visualization by micro CT revealed that OCT may not detect all microfractures in calcific plugs. Notably, the amount of calcium fractures, calcium thickness, and the continuous calcium arc are not predictors of stent expansion. However, as already known, the balloon to artery ratio was defined as a strong predictor of stent expansion. Outcome analysis revealed no serious angiographic complications of IVL. And 30 day maze analysis showed in 4.6% non Q wave myocardial infarction. Conclusions of these OCT sub analysis of the disrupt CAD pooled study are the present individual patient data pooled analysis of four studies represents the largest evaluation of IVL by OCT. No serious angiographic complications were observed confirming the safety of the IVL for the treatment of severely calcified coronary lesions. OCT demonstrated extensive calcium fracture after IVL treatment with excellent stent expansion of severely calcified lesions. And visible calcium fracture and calcium characteristics were not predictors of stent expansion 
following treatment with IVF. Now I would like to focus on eccentric versus concentric lesions. When we started with IVL, we selected patients with concentric lesions as you will see in the first case presentation later on. However, newer data have been presented recently so that we can change now our selection process. In this analysis, four different groups divided into quartiles based on maximum calcium angle have been investigated. Lesion length was similar in all groups. However, the calcified length was longest in concentric lesions. The maximum continuous calcium arc was 131, 225, 309, and 360 degree, respectively. There were similar procedural approaches across all quartiles. Procedure time, contrast volume, IVL catheters per patient, pulses delivered, post-stent dilatation rate were similar. Only there was a trend towards higher pre-dilatation rates in patients with concentric lesions. Interestingly, the minimum stent area was similar in all groups and also the stent expansion at the maximum calcium site was statistically not different. Here are representative OCT images of an eccentric lesion pre-IVL, post-IVL with calcium fractures and post-stenting showing a good luminal gain following IVL treatment. The same is showing here for a lesion of an calcium angle of around 220 degree. And here for a lesion with a continuous calcium angle of 360 degree. Here you can see that increased calcium equals increased visible fractures, meaning that in eccentric calcic calcific lesions with a continuous calcium arc below 180 degree, only 23% of lesions showing visible fractures, whereas in concentric calcific lesions, in almost all cases, visible fractures are present. The same happens with the number of visible fractures per lesion as showing on the right-hand side. Interestingly, the minimum stent area and the stent expansion is consistent regardless of visible fractures, suggesting again that OCT may not detect all microfractures in calcific flux. Post-stent OCT outcomes show that there are consistent results regardless of the calcium angle in terms of mean lumen area, mean stent area, and mean stent expansion. Only malopposed stent struts were observed more often in concentric lesions. Conclusions of these OCT sub-analysis of the disrupt CAD pool study are OCT demonstrated consistent MSA and stent expansion outcomes in eccentric and concentric calcium. Increased IVL-induced calcium fracture was observed in proportion to the amount of calcium. Consistent MSA and stent expansion outcomes were observed regardless of the presence of visible calcium fracture. And the last part of the disrupt CAD pool study, which I would like to present, uh, to you is the gender analysis. It is known that female gender is an independent predictor of adverse clinical events after PCI of lesions with coronary artery calcifications. The sub-analysis of the Disrupt CAD pool study comprises 628 patients from 72 global sites in 12 countries. The objective was to compare outcomes between women and men following treatment of de novo calcified lesions with shockwave IVL, and the primary endpoint was 30-day MACE, and primary effectiveness endpoint was procedural success defined as successful stent delivery with residual stenosis below 30% without in-hospital MACE. Patient characteristics are shown here. Women were older, fewer smoker, and had more often renal insufficiency. Angiographic characteristics show that the reference vessel diameter in women was smaller and the lesion length shorter. Procedure time was a bit longer in men as well as more IVL catheters have been used and more IVL pulses were applied in men. Outcome analysis revealed no difference in the primary safety and effectiveness endpoint between gender. 
and angiographic outcomes show that there is similar reduction in diameter stenosis, however, statistically greater acute gain and larger MAD in men. Complication rates were low and similar in women and men. And for the in-hospital and 30-day maze, there were statistically also no differences. Conclusions of these sub-analysis of the disrupt CAD pool studies are, the current disrupt CAD pool sub-analysis represents the largest assessment to date of sex-based IVL treatment in de novo calcified arteries to facilitate stent implantation Excellent safety and effectiveness outcomes to 30 days were achieved in both women and men following IVL treatment. And ongoing follow up is needed to assess the long term safety and effectiveness of IVL in women. Now, I would like to present you two cases of our own experience. The first one was done in the very early phase to get experience with the IVL shockwave therapy, and the second one was performed around one year ago. The first patient is a 50-year-old man with new onset of angina and shortness of breath. He had some risk factors, arterial hypertension, diabetes, dyslipidemia. He was a past smoker and a little bit of overweight. Here you can see the initial angiography of the left coronary system. There was a significant lesion of the proximal LAD. And what is more important, there were a lot of visible calcium around the lesion. And on the right coronary artery was a tight stenosis in the middle part. However, the whole segment was diseased. So we decided to start with the right coronary artery with predilatation and stent implantation, as you can see here. Here you can see the final result of the right coronary artery. But the severe calcification was on the left coronary artery in the proximal LED. Because of the heavy calcified lesion of the LED, we wanted to characterize the calcium density in more detail. Therefore, we performed a core CT for the measurement of the Hounsfield units. And as you can see here, there was a 360 degree concentric calcified plug. Here, with Hounsfield units of 1,641, meaning that the density of the calcification is above the density of bone. We started the intervention. Here again, the heavily calcified lesion in the proximal LED, OCT confirmed the concentric calcification. And furthermore, the image here suggests also that the thickness of the calcium load is very much pronounced. IVA therapy with 80 pulses was performed using a 3.5 times 12 millimeter shockwave balloon. And then the question is which kind of stent we should use. Well, in general, there are different clinical scenarios. And in our point of view, there could be an impact of individual stent selection. For heavily calcified lesions, a robust stability against stent recoil is needed. Therefore, a superior radial strength, which can be achieved with thicker stent struts, may be required. On the other hand, ultra thin stent struts may be beneficial in terms of TLF and TLR in the long term. After IVL, the ultra thin Superflex 3.0 times 36 millimeter stent was placed. Post dilatation with a non compliant emerge 3.5 times 50 millimeter balloon followed by a second OCT was performed. And overall, there was a good stent strut apposition and expansion of the stent, no edge dissections and no thrombus formations. Only in the very proximal part of the stand, there were three millimeter of malopause stand struts. Final angiogram revealed also a very acceptable result. A 
And the conclusion of the first case is use cardiac coronary imaging for procedure planning and PCI guiding. IBL offers a new simple, safe, and highly effective methods, method to prepare heavily calcified coronary lesions. And ultra thin struts DES can be used in all lesions. Optimal lesion preparation is key to success. Second case presentation. This is an 86 year old male patient living quite independently in his flat together with his wife. There was no known cardiovascular disease. He has a cardiovascular risk factor, diabetes mellitus. And since three weeks, he had progressive signs of heart failure. So he came to our hospital and ECG and lab values are presented here. There is no CK, however, there are slightly elevated myoglobin and troponin values and highly elevated BNP values. So this is a typical case of a decompensated heart failure patient. Echocardiography revealed a severely reduced ejection fraction with akinesia of inferior, lateral, anterior and septal segments. The coronary angiogram showed a chronic occluded RCX and diagonal branch. Furthermore, there was a heavily calcified lesion in the proximal LED. Here are different views of the left coronary system with a chronic occluded RCX and diagonal branch. The right coronary artery showed multiple significant lesions from proximal to distal. And the question is now what to do next? Optimal, optical, optimal medical therapy, PCI, cabbage, or additional tests? I guess we are sure that there is a prognostic relevant coronary artery disease. We performed cardiac MRI as an additional test, as also recommended in the guidelines. And MRI revealed a transmural scar in the territories of the RCX and the diagonal branch. So these two arteries uh, were um, chronic occluded. And furthermore, there was viability in the RCA and in the LAD. In the next step, we followed the guideline recommendation and calculated different risk scores. The STS score was eight, the Euro score two, 14, and the syntax score 46. The syntax Score two revealed a four year mortality for PCI of 99% and 62% for cabbage. In the guidelines, there were factors described which may help us in decision making. In this regard, the advanced age of the patient would, of course, favor the PCI approach, whereas other factors as diabetes, severely reduced LBEF, the high syntax score, and the severely calcified coronary artery lesions favors more the cabbage approach. So the question comes again, should we leave the patient on optimal medical therapy or should we perform PCI or cabbage? The recommendation of the guidelines were 1A for cabbage and 3A for PCI. However, we have to keep in mind that a lot of patients do not fit into guidelines because there are only studies available for patients of age 55 to 65 with normal ejection fraction. There are absolutely no studies for patients on age above 80 with severely reduced ejection fraction below 20%. So we talked to the patient and his family and decided us after hard team discussion for an impeller assisted high-risk PCI, which was performed in a single axis technique. For the heavily calcified lesion of the proximal LED, we performed IVL shockwave therapy under impeller support. Thanks, Green, so we tell you go. 
and implanted a Megatron stand with a very acceptable result. And in the right coronary artery, we also implanted three Megatron stands in the same intervention. The impeller could be removed immediately after PCI, and the patient was discharged home at day five after PCI. And by this, I'm at the end of my presentation, and I would thank you very much for your attention, and I'm happy to discuss with you the meeting later on. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Christian. Uh, fabulous talk, a lot of learning points, a lot of take-home messages. We don't have the liberty of so many uh, you know, uh, investigations easily available to us, like the cardiac MRI or the, for, even for that matter, the coronary CT. Dr. Hasra, your your comments, your takes, your yeah, both the cases are very nicely done. The proof of pudding is by eating. If the heart failure improves, it is your job which made him better. And there is no test which can tell you uh, in, in total reality that this patient is not going to benefit or going to benefit after angioplasty. So in our uh, uh, hospital after stitch trial, if somebody is young, relatively young, and uh, relatively uh, manageable risk factors, we go ahead with the repercussions, revascularization in severe LV dysfunction because that is the best option on the top of good medical therapy. Now, using uh, IVL in this case is very, very appropriate. If you use rota, though it can be done on impella, but those who are not doing impella, do, do not have access to impella, rota is definitely no-no in these cases. So IVL, severe LV dysfunction, and shockwave is a uh, jugalbandi, I mean, it's a, a synchrony between these two devices and can be done. And uh, nice case presentation. Thank you. Your opinion, and then you can Actually, uh, uh, I congrats uh, Dr. Christian for presenting a, uh, two uh, representative cases in a very uh, nicer way with a guideline directed uh, uh, interventions. In the first case, uh, it is the integrated imaging which guided the uh, devices actually. If you take uh, a CT angio where it's a circumferential calcium with the high household units and OCT classically demonstrated uh, the high calcium score along with the fractures. That is most important actually in our day-to-day -day practice which we'll do. And another important thing, uh, the IVL compared to the other ablative devices if you compare, not only visible, invisible fractures, so that the compliance, especially deeper calcium, will be more uh, pulverized, so that uh, the compliance of the vessel will be improved, so that uh, a minimal stent area will be more compared to the other ablative devices. That is number two. And if you take the second case, very interesting, because in the presence of severe dysfunction, as uh, he uh, one of the beautiful chip case he presented, the complex high risk indicates the angioplasty with the help of IVL. Whereas uh, Dr. Hazra suggested the rota ablation, of course, once the, you put the impella, there's no difference between the um, rota ablation and IVL. But suppose if impella is not implanted, the microvasculature clogging with the debris will be more with rota, which is a, not an absolute contraindication, but relatively. The IVL scores, especially this becomes a, a it scores over the rota ablation in the presence of severe LV dysfunction or low moderate LV dysfunction, where the microvasculature is a diseased and where the patient can't tolerate the no flow phenomena or slow flow phenomena, where the IVL is act which scores over the uh, etherectomy, that is rota ablation. Thank you. Absolutely. absolutely. So, uh, two comments. One is, uh, Dr. Christian, you have a very Good looking team, very handsome people, yourself included. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I require Dr. Srivastava, Professor Srivastava, your comments, and then we will go on to Dr. Kaparthi's presentation. Thank you, sir, and uh, 
cases were as everyone has discussed were very representative they were what uh, we see uh, in most of our cases here also and uh, iel definitely has made us uh, a new mode where these calcium challenges can be easily dealt and day and day out it has become very popular now we are using it almost uh, for every time we see a calcium you know rota has its uh, benefits but it comes with a number of limitations there is a long learning curve and with uh, ivl this learning curve probably is is uh, you know uh, very small it's very less that is all i have to say dr parthi you can state your parthi you can start your presentation please so am i visible and audible yes okay so uh, this is one of the uh, representative case which i give with avl so as we know uh, the head to head comparison with ivl and rota blader ivl scores in two important situation one is a technical difficulty where the bend with calcium which are the enemies to the intervention cardiologist so the rota blader has a, a relatively a, a potentially more problems compared to the ivl that is number one and second one is a one of the another compelling indication i will tell that uh, the previously dr christian presented that is a cbl v dysfunction uh, with a, a heavy calcium where you have to select the etherectomy device i will select ivl compared to the rota so with this background i will present a, a, a rocky terrain of rca how ivl i uh, used uh, and overcome the difficulties so this is a patient of 65 4 years old gentleman having risk factors of diabetes and hypertension presented with exertion angina class 2 with crescendo nature class 3 and uh, ecg is showing uh, antolateral ischemic changes and uh, his uh, troponin is also positive and a good lv function echo and his basal angiogram having a normal left corner system and uh, shepard curve right corner artery with the proximal and mid segment calcific uh, tight lesion so these are the uh, angiographic uh, uh, presentation of uh, this uh, right corner artery where you can the shepard crook with a calcium in the two bends in the proximal bend as well as mid segment bend so first i have taken the uh, amplage uh, seven french catheter but constantly in spite of the uh, uh, the uh, fenestration that is hold uh, 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 al1 the still patient can't tolerate getting angina with the stt changes so i have to shift for the support uh, to the judkins right with the guide extension support so with that it gives a reasonable support so first i prepared the bed of proximal segment as well as mid segment uh, with the 2 into 10 mm of balloon and which adequate dilatation up to 12 atmospheres after the preparing bed then the proximal this was uh, uh, pre dilated proximal segment then after preparation of the bed i have taken the ivl that is 3 into uh, 10 ivl and uh, i across the proximal segment delivered almost uh, uh, five cycles i delivered uh, the uh, this energy ultrasonic energy then after lesion preparation this is a continued the lesion preparation five cycles so after that one so this is the result after the ivl uh, uh, that is delivery of the uh, five cycles then we put the proximal uh, stent 3 to 18 stent uh, ever limus inducing stent we put that is a, a zines and then expanded and then post dilated with a 3 to 10 nc balloon then this is the where i find difficulty where in spite of the uh, hectic maneuvers uh, almost you can take the guide extension catheter almost it is an exaggerated amplage curve into the stent i have taken with the uh, um, is a uh, guy uh, balloon assisted guide gel uh, uh, advancement and then the density balloon which uh, advanced into the mid segment and prepared the mid segment lesion also calcific lesion and then 
here it is very difficult uh, uh, in spite of i want to deliver this tent for the mid segment region but lot of difficulties even with a inchworm technique uh, we are unable to advance the guidezilla across the proximal stent so i changed the strategy so with a ampulla 7 french buddy wire i have taken because the guidezilla failed so with the buddy wire i can able to deliver the balloon and then ultimately the lesion was prepared adequately in the mid segment and the stent was delivered to the mid segment that is a uh, 3 into uh, 12 mm and then uh, ad adequately post and dilatation was done and we got the final result so the conclusion of the story is uh, a new block modification tools especially uh, in calcific lesions change the trajectory and outcomes as we know the calcium and acute bends are the enemies which are posing a difficult coronal anatomy anatomies and the challenging subsets in angioplasty where the rotational lithectomy especially have some limitation in uh, bends with calcium because of the differential cut sometimes the perforation chances are very very high so a step wise approach and appropriate use of the block modification tools like nc balloon cutting scoring balloons and intravascular ethotripsy as we have uh, dr krishnan already presented which is a more aggressive ethotripsy device compared to others uh, they are necessary for both acute and long term outcomes of course use of supportive catheters guideline guide extension catheters and buddy wire which you can uh, interchangeably you can use to overcome the difficulties if one strategy fails you have to follow the second strategy they play a key role in success outcomes thank you thank you dr pardi <clears throat> lot of learning from your case uh, uh, there is a new guide guide extension which has come out called guide pro i have used it and i found it extremely useful and it's uh, it, it's able to maneuver through other things which are uh, which are otherwise impossible to dr hazra your opinion first and dr christian yeah oh. i think uh, the uh, academic point in this case will be good guide support but i could not see any imaging uh, Uh, either OCT or intravascular ultrasound. Look, you can pass the stent, and uh, you can uh, play with uh, different types of balloon, uh, uh, this uh, high pressure balloon, to prepare the lesion. But the natural history of this calcium is yet not known after IVF. Whether they grow again, they go grow inside the uh, coronary starts, the nodule protrudes, the tissue protrudes. so those informations because if you make them loose your stem may go in but the calcium can still remain there unlike your rota so that enigma is still there so that's why the image guidance sir to understand to understand when something else like you can reduce the volume by doing a rota additional rota but you cannot reduce the calcium by doing ivl you just modify you know, breaking and making the path easier and making the thing thing very supple and uh, simple so the story of the calcium in there perhaps we have to wait for the long term data the behavior of the calcium the tissue behind the stent the devil behind the stent is more important maybe in the long term than the devil which was there before putting a stent But nicely done. Thank you. Dr. Hazra, one point actually I want to ask you, Dr. Mahesh, also. So, uh, what is your experience with the heavy calcium with bend? Because in spite of the calcium preparation, the bend will pose a, a very, very, very difficulty in passing your uh, hardware. What I observed so many times. So that's why the rotor blade I am more scared of, especially in acute bends. What I want to convey, because I have seen so many in NIC presentations. Just after the rota, you will see the just end with the perforations. So yes, yes, somebody, uh, you have to use a, a large uh, guiding catheter. You can you can pass your rota on your large uh, GEC support. You can go distally, and once you pass this rota distally, uh, I mean negotiating this bend rota still can be done. Uh, then if you can use uh, rota extra support, still can be done. But the problem with the extra support is your bias of the rota. It will cause more complications. So, according to the effect of the bias, so uh, guiding support 
uh, is good uh, uh, tip. Second will be the guide extension, as Dr. Manesh uh, Mahesh was mentioning, the newer guide extension with more lumin, I mean, lu luminous, and uh, the metrics are different. And definitely, IVL followed by rota is also kind of options, or kind of OPN balloon followed by IVL, or OPN followed by IVL followed by laser followed by rota. It, it's Thing can be done in very, very difficult cases. Thank and you. imaging, especially uh, OCT, these bands, and it is very, very sleek. Remember, the OCT I have seen in the bands, okay, it is straightforward calcium, okay. But the bands, we have find that it becomes a, a double uh, imaging, like it will, it will think you have a guide extension, you can do the OCT over the guide extension. The yes, yes. The guide extension, you can in the bands, I am telling, bands, I am telling, very difficult. Agree. Yeah. Thank you. So two points, Dr. Hasra. But the, the rotor debug is only 0.5 millimeter. If you have a 1.1 millimeter, you know, uh, hardly any debulking is done by rotor in the same. And uh, laser and uh, calcium, I'm not sure how effective that is. Dr. Christian, your experience and your opinion on the gates, please. First of all, thank you very much for sharing with us this very nice uh, case. Um, maybe um, I missed this, but the, the exercise side uh, for this intervention, was this a radial or femoral approach? This it is femoral approach. Femoral approach. Okay, perfect. Yes. Because, uh, this is, uh, you know, I know that the modern way to, to treat uh, lesions is a radial approach, but I'm always uh, telling to my colleagues when I would be on the table, please never use my radial. I'm um, more... Um, are convinced about the femoral approach, uh, especially in these complex uh, uh, lesions. And um, the other thing, I guess you mentioned this, the anchor technique for the, for the guide cilla. Um, yes. This um, often helps uh, to inflate a small balloon in the distal part of the artery, and then you can, you can more easily advance uh, the guiding uh, or the guide cilla um, uh, extension catheter. Uh, but this is uh, especially when we have this anatomy and with uh, calcifications and a stent already in place, uh, very, very difficult and not always working. Uh, and then, of course, I guess this is a typical case where you have to deal with uh, different approaches, uh, a combination of small balloons, try again, try to um, have a better support, um, uh, strong wires and all this. But, uh, for the uh, master class participants, I guess an excellent case. Thank you very much. Dr. Dr. Mamanik uh, Jawan is there from yeah, yeah. I, I, I thought I brought him from Dr. Mohan yeah. case onwards. I just want to know about your, uh, Dr. Christian, your opinion on laser and uh, calcium. Examine laser. laser. Examine laser. laser. Yeah. I have no experience with, with laser. Okay. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, so I, we will go to the next speaker, which is Dr. Mani. Dr. Mohan is a consultant interventional cardiologist from Kauai Medical Center and Hospital. His left his expertise is left main interventions, primary PCIs, bifurcation, TAVI, and chronic total inclusion interventions. Dr. Mohan, you may start sharing your slide, and after this, we'll have the discussions continuing. Uh, thanks, everyone. It's a great forum uh, to present here, actually. And uh, can you able to see my slide? Sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, okay. Thank you. And so this is a history of the patient, which is 71 year old active male, but had a, uh, in December 2021, infro posterior MI for which not lysed, no primary PCA done, which is outside. And uh, uh, he had a critical osteal LMCA with the calcific triple cell disease and severe LB dysfunction and recurrent pulmonary edema. He got out, uh, admitted outside, uh, then came back here for further management. Associated with is having a COPD, diabetes, and as well as a bilateral peripheral vascular disease and recurrent TAA symptoms. And he had a last episode, which was six months before. And a recent COVID positive status, and along with that, he has been treated three weeks before. So his synthesis score for this uh, case is 36, and uh, he has been opted for CHIP PCI. And this is a, 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 the, the LAD lesion, which has been a calcified one. And uh, there is a L6 lesion at the mid portion of the LCX. And uh, so it has been uh, proceeded with uh, uh, the L6 PCA first, which was quite easy to do it, the pre dilatation, and subsequently the stenting has been done. And uh, so this is a post NC dilatation. And uh, 
then this case was presented with the IVS because of the LV dysfunction. And uh, so this is a uh, pre uh, uh, the MLA area of 5.03, which has been the post proximal minimal stent area is around 7.36. And uh, <clears throat> this uh, uh, the, the mid LCX uh, uh, MLA with the 2.22, that's a lesion area where it has been become 5.39 mm square. This is uh, the, the IVS of the, the, the pre PCA LCX and uh, as well as the post PCA LCX, which is on the other side. And where you can to appreciate there is a good amount of uh, dilatation and uh, the the of position, which has been very good um, um, in the longitudinal uh, view. And now to come back to the, the main one, uh, which has been here, I, as I already told you, there is a, been a classified uh, as a, a, a calcific lesion in the LAD, where there is a more visible calcium which has been seen at the proximal portion of the uh, LAD. So what I have done is the pre-dilatation which has been done with the, 2 into 15 balloon, which is a balloon crossable lesion. Once the balloon is crossable, uh, then we have to put the calcium score by doing the uh, either IVS or OCT and decide about the further strategic management. So this is the OCT which has been done for this uh, case because to assess the calcium thickness and other stuff. And you can able to see that there is a calcium mark which is around 270 degree with the length which has been more than 11.2 millimeter and thickness is more than one millimeter. So calcium score here is a OCT, it says around 5. And uh, when you look at the IVS calcium, it is around 276 calcium. So and circumference calcium also there. It's just more of the calcium which has been presented at the uh, osteoproximal LED to the proximal LED. The mid portion of the LED is majority which has been covered by the predominantly fibrolipid block. So this is the algorithm which I have been followed it. And uh, so I was score of around uh, six and uh, OCT uh, score of around five. So lithotripsy has been a one option. When there is a lipo lithotripsy balloon which has been non crossable, then we have to think about rotational arthritomy or orbital arthritomy. So this is the OCT criteria. Uh, it's been a similar uh, 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 the algorithm. And here the calcium score, as I already mentioned, uh, by OCT five, so I was is six. So this is a, a shockwave lithotripsy with a 3 to 12 millimeter IVL balloon. Always we had to use the 1 is to 1 size of uh, balloon for two. It has to touch the wall, then only it leave the uh, good, uh, um, uh, good uh, uh, the cracking of the uh, calcium. Uh, you could able to appreciate that I have started with the, uh, that, uh, uh, the proximal to middle lady junction to the proximal LED, uh, uh, the IVL. So where there is a 80 pulse has been divided and given. And this is a post IVL and uh, the uh, uh, and with the post dilatation with the NC balloon. Uh, this is a check angiogram where you could able to appreciate there is a lesion at the osteal uh, LMC also. And uh, so this is a LED, the post IVL where you could able to appreciate that more amount of cracks uh, everywhere just from the mid LED, mid LED junction to the proximal LED. And uh, Subsequently, I have stented the uh, that uh, proximal to middle LED, then the left main to uh, LED. Then the work was a bit easy for me. And uh, this is a post dilatation with the NC balloon. And the pot has been done to the uh, uh, LMCA. And uh, this is a, a LED, uh, the post LED, where there is expansion criteria which has been fulfilled. And where you could able to see that L6 osteum is free of uh, uh, the carina is free. And uh, there is a blood swell which has been there and uh, where we all uh, uh, could able to the left main is very difficult to uh, um, uh, get it from the uh, OCT apart from the distal LMCA. And this is the IVS final run and uh, because to see the LMCA and this is a uh, left main is uh, well exposed, I mean well expanded and uh, you could able to uh, appreciate it by the, the LAD Austin MSA is around 8.28 and uh, and this is a LAD Austin is around 7.05, this is our OCT measurement and uh, so the LM is uh, around 7.91 which has been pre and the post is around 14.33 mm. And uh, so this is a, a distal lump. 
uh, which has been a 13.11 mm square. So where you could able to appreciate there's been a final angio. And uh, where I could able to get the good result here. So the take home message is all chip cases need medicalist plan to avoid intra and post procedural complications. Calcium algorithm either with IVS or OCT will give a clue on calcium lesion modification strategy. Here I use the IVL for the uh, as per the algorithm. And sometimes the combined imaging will be helpful to know the additional pre or post procedural information and the as well as the complication. See why I'm saying this was here. I used the combined uh, um, uh, IVS and as well as OCT. So IVS, which is for the mainly for the left mind and OCT for mainly for the to see the calcium assessment, especially for the thickness of the calcium on the step. Suppose the thickness of the calcium is very high, they can, then we can use the still, uh, you know, there is a nodules are there. Uh, we can save off by uh, save off by the uh, doing the rota and as well as uh, subsequently IVL would have helped at that kind of cases and the again the intravascular throat balloon crossable calcification it has an additional advantage as well as a very good safety in calcification modification especially in severe elbridge function patient and we have to mandatory to know migrant score especially when we are doing a dye volume in chip cases in this case i have used entire oct i have used all all the thing has been done with ivs except two three uh, um, um, that uh, runs off that OCT for the LAD and as well as supposed PCA LAD OCT. And uh, so the OCT has an own advantages in chip cases, especially in knowing the bifurcation carina and as well as a calcium assessment score. Thank you. Thank you for the attention. And I would like to take up the questions. Excellent case, uh, Dr. Mohan. You have uh, you've illustrated all the points very well. Uh, two things I would say is one is that that old concept of 789 for uh, circumflex LED and proximal uh, LMC is no longer valid. Even Indian left means go to 13 and 14. So we should yeah. try and get more volumes. And second point is that post IVL, post CT is a, uh, it may not show you much of information because most of the cracks may be just micro fracture, micro cracks, which may not be seen on OCT. So post OCT, you should straight away go and dilate and see if you can actually, you know, uh, Go ahead with this study, and then pro probably after that you can do an OCT run. Uh, I would like to introduce and invite uh, uh, the chief consultant of United Hospital Bangladesh, Dr. Professor Omen Isman. So your comments and your uh, opinion on the case, and we can take on from there. You're muted, yeah. You're muted, sir. We can't hear you. Sir, you are muted. Good afternoon, sir. No, your, your, your headset is not working, sir. The headset is not working. You just disconnect the headset, probably you'll be able to hear you. Uh, uh, oh, sorry. Am yeah. I audible now? Yes, yes sir. Uh, audible. Uh, 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 sir, please just stop sharing. There is a loop in meeting. Am I audible? Yes, yes sir. You are audible. And okay, okay. Thank, thank you very much. Stop sharing, sir. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, giving me a chance to be part of this uh, wonderful uh, panelist. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much uh, to Mohan. Uh, it's a really good case, and uh, he has done it, has done it nicely. Uh, with the use of multiple uh, devices like IVL, OCT, and uh, IVAS. Truly, uh, in uh, my practice, uh, uh, around 10-15% patient, uh, especially the elderly and diabetic patient, have got severe calcification. But not all patients truly need uh, this uh, high-tech uh, procedure. My usual practice is if I see uh, spotted calcium, uh, by fluoroscopy, then I initially use uh, double wire uh, uh, across the lesion and uh, use a high pressure balloon, uh, not necessarily opium balloon, normal conventional uh, NC balloon to go up to the high, up to 20 atmosphere to see the, any uh, indentation by seeing the spinning of the fluoroscopy. Uh, if there is any screening, uh, uh, any any indentation, that indicate 
that part of the vessel is not well uh, uh, expanded. And uh, sometimes I use uh, um, uh, IVAS to see the circumferential calcium. One important thing is that if there is a heavily calcified vessel with circumferential calcium, initial, um, initially it's very difficult to cross the balloon. In that case only, I prefer uh, rotor ablation. Recently, I have done one patient with a left main uh, distal uh, with heavily calcified uh, 81 years old male uh, with tram track calcification. It was uh, 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 very difficult to open up by conventional balloon. And the vessel size was 3.5. So rota uh, at the beginning was not much helpful to, to abolish the calcium. So with the help of Godzilla, I used the, uh, uh, the IVL catheter to, to crack the lesion. And then I used the high pressure balloon with the same technique of using double balloon to expand it much more. And, and I got a, a very good result with that. And uh, finally, I uh, placed the stent and post uh, uh, IVAS shows a reasonably good uh, outcome. In heavily calcific uh, lesion, you may not get a good uh, uh, post stent uh, 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 expansion all through. At place, you may get very good. At place, you may not get. But the thing is that, uh, it should be uh, adequately opened up, uh, as you mentioned, the approximately if it is uh, six or six, seven uh, centimeters, uh, millimeters square area, that is enough to at least uh, at least uh, give a good result. May not be excellent, but in in, in some cases you'll have to compromise uh, because of the eccentricity of the calcium. You may need to be satisfied with uh, the available gazette you use it. That's Thank all you. I can say about the calcification handling in my private practice. Uh, Thank so you. So we'll, uh, we'll ask you, we'll come back to you after the next presentation. Dr. Christian, uh, your comments on this case and uh, you'll have to comment on every case. So we'll have your comments on this case and uh, your opinion on chronic total occlusions being tackled uh, with the uh, IVL guru. Mm -hmm. so first of all, I guess this is a very excellent case, uh, which we uh, just uh, have presented now. And it's uh, always good uh, to plan the intervention, especially also, of course, for uh, chronic total occlusions. You need a clear plan A, but also you need a, a plan B or maybe also C. Uh, and uh, this was very um, well presented. And what I also like very much, um, um, he, he followed very nicely the algorithms uh, and also to follow guidelines. We have excellent guidelines, but but as I uh, tried to um, uh, have uh, presented you, we have guidelines and algorithms, but we make to be sure that our patient who is on the table fits exactly to these guidelines or algorithms. Otherwise, we have to um, find an individual approach. And, uh, but in, in most cases, um, uh, guidelines and algorithms are excellent. And this was very nicely presented how he follows the, the uh, current um, uh, algorithms. Um, I would like to um, just um, give you my opinion about road ablation. Um, in, in Europe, especially in, in our uh, country, we are not using road ablation uh, so often anymore. Um, now the shockwave therapy is coming more and more device like a normal balloon because I think I would only choose the road ablator um, uh, when I'm not able to pass the lesion with a balloon. So this is my, my personal opinion. Um, I, I know there are some other arguments uh, why we should use the rotor ablation and maybe we should also um, try to have a combination of, of different devices. First rotor ablation, then there's also discussion, do we need really um, high pressure balloon dilatation or not? When we take a look to all these studies, uh, the pre-dilatation rate, um, I mean, the, um, the pre and the post dilatation rate uh, was not um, that high. And um, the problem which I see when I uh, try to prepare the lesion only with a balloon in heavily calcified lesions, then we choose a balloon, which is uh, often smaller than the initial stand. And then it's hard to see if the balloon um, has a nice, um, is, is going, uh, um, 
uh, of nicely or not. So um, then you have to be sure that you really choose a balloon in a one-to-one -one ratio. Otherwise, uh, the shockwave therapy is an excellent device because you crack the calcium deep also in the vessel wall. So it's uh, then much easier for a stent uh, to, um, to um, yeah, treat the lesion. And um, yeah, but for, for CTOs, this was your last question, we um, are using all, uh, also shockwave therapy, but especially also here, we need a very good lesion preparation. Unfortunately, we have no long-term data, which are very good for, for CTO cases. And uh, maybe we can, um, we can improve the outcomes uh, also in these highly complex cases of uh, chronic total occlusions when we prepare the lesions also deep in the in the vessel wall with shockwave therapy. This is my opinion. Yeah. In India, we have coined the term rotatripsy. I don't know if it's available. It's the same thing that you people use also. You do a rotablation first, then you follow it up with the lithotripsy, and then you follow it with an opian balloon. So if after the rot IVL, you have done rotablation, you have done IVL, and still doesn't the, the balloon, the, uh, the post dilatation balloon doesn't open up, then what is your strategy? Um, so yeah, this is very rarely the case, I have to say, you know, I have uh, a couple of cases where we implanted a stand and then we see that uh, the expansion is not perfect. And then the question, I, I know that it's not maybe the best topic for this masterclass here, but uh, do we can do um, IVL shockwave therapy also after stand implantation? Uh, the official comment from the companies, of course, uh, don't do this, but uh, I'm... Uh, just here right now, not in Switzerland, I'm in Germany on the annual uh, Congress of the German Society of, uh, of Cardiology. And here are a lot of poster uh, presentations, especially about this issue. And uh, maybe we will learn more and more in the future about this, um, this um, other option to do shockwave therapy after stand implantation. Thank you. Now we'll go on to Dr. Manokar Panchanantam for the next case. He's a senior consultant at the SRMC Hospital Chennai. Uh, he's in, his expertise is in intervention, cardiology, coronary, and structural. After this case, we will keep the discussion going. Dr. Manokar, all yours. Thank you, sir. Thanks for the kind, uh, kind invitation and uh, thanks, uh, thanks for, enough for this opportunity. It is always a pleasure to talk after Mohan because uh, Mohan prepares the bed for us so well, then, then the stent implantation becomes easier. So thanks, Mohan, for the nice lucid talk. Uh, mine is a case actually, uh, in fact, I, I am not sure which case these guys have picked up, but uh, uh, I think this is a case of rotatripsy. Yes, okay. Since sir mentioned rotatripsy, I think they decided to go with this uh, thing. So this was precisely the thing. The main reason I present this case is because I have a lot of questions. So I thought I will ask the expert panel as well as the, uh, you know, international faculty. So the idea of presenting is to uh, improvise my you know, understanding and uh, learn from the masters. So to go briefly through the history, it's a 76 year old male with history of chest pain for a month, known diabetic, hypertensive, hypothyroid and regular treatment. Next. Uh, nothing spectacular in the examination. Next. The, next. Good LV, no, but some ECG changes, uh, rest of things are good. So he had significant lesion in the uh, LAD, circumflex and uh, RCA. And this guy was offered surgery, which he refused. So after a lot of counseling and cajoling uh, uh, from him towards me, I agreed to do a, a PTCA to start off with. I thought, let me do it. So start with the RCA because RCA looked more uh, significant in the clinical, uh, in the evaluation. Next. Next, so uh, it was uh, planned to do the RCA. If you look at the RCA, as uh, people mentioned about the tram track appearance, I think it, the, this is probably the, you know, uh, the nightmarish tram track. So before you can see that the lesion tram track is there, even in portion of the RCA, which seems to be normal. So, uh, and also at the level of the lesion. So it's like a tram track uh, for a long duration, for a long distance, starting from the proximal portion of the RCA to the mid portion of RCA. Next. So we also had the same strategy of trying to uh, get imaging like Mohan showed in an algorithm, how we would like to proceed. 
but uh, uh, you know we tried to cross the lesion and then we thought we'll get in a imaging catheter but uh, obviously we couldn't get it across next so uh, we thought let me uh, you know increase the support uh, try to give some kind of support by you know uh, wiring the, uh, the coronal artery that didn't help next in fact, the guide was uh, uh, giving us good support, but uh, since we could not get anything across, so we decided, okay, we are going ahead with uh, rotablation because we were not able to get even a, uh, this thing. So we tried with the free dilatation, the 1.25 balloon with the two balloon following that. Now you have the guide sitting right across inside the RCM. Next. So... We, uh, despite that, you, you can appreciate that not much headway has been made. Next slide. So we decided to go ahead with a rota uh, floppy wire. So based with fine trust, we changed over to rota floppy. Next. Next. So we went ahead and did a rota ablation, uh, tried to... Uh, you know, a shave off the calcium to the extent that we could possibly do. And uh, uh, luckily, we were worried about whether the burr will cross. But if you see in the slide on the left, the burr simply uh, walked through. So I know it was a little scary the way the burr moved uh, this thing. But uh, luckily, we got out, got away without any issues. But the movement uh, is not as I would have wished. So then once the rotablation was done, uh, next. Subsequently, we thought we let us uh, do adequate uh, post dilatation and then get the imaging done, next. So we tried to uh, get the IVS next across. And uh, if you see the IVS, you can see in the proximal portion of the RCA, there is cal uh, this is from distal end. Uh, there is a lot of disease in that, but the vessel looks good in size. Now the calcium is coming in. There is an arc of calcium almost 360 degree in the initial portion. And then at least some lesions, some less calcium, but lesion being tight. Again, calcium, almost calcium everywhere. So you can see, you know, the here the important thing is uh, here the vessel looks good, but the calcium is... Uh, not deep seated, it's more of superficial. So we can really appreciate the calcium and see that here you have 360 degree calcium and the lumen is also very small. So I think uh, the, uh, the this is what we would have expected in the from the angiogram also. So then we thought, let us uh, get in a guideliner for more support next. So next. So now uh, we we try to get this since uh, now this is something which I want the uh, senior faculty to comment on. So that, that the IVS that I showed you was post 1.5, uh, uh, you know, rotablation. So my question that I would, you know, uh, like to know at the end of the meeting is how many of, uh, of you would have tried to upgrade to a 1.75 or maybe a 2 bulb to deal with the calcium that uh, was shown after the rotablation. At that point of time, I did not have the two on shelf. I had the 1.75 on shelf, but I was a little skeptical. So I thought of playing it safe. So I tried to use IVL with a three into 12 millimeter balloon. Next. So 80 pulses were delivered across the lesion in the proximal RCA, in the distal RCA. Next. Next. So post IVL, if you see the IVL, IVS run, the things look little better than the previous. As, uh, as Sir mentioned in the previous part, some of the fractures are kind of maybe microscopic, but at least it helps the stent expand at a later date. So that is something which, uh, you know, is the good part about IVL that uh, although physically the calcium may appear to be in the same place, but uh, they do tend to look better once you expand it. So here we come to the tighter portions and then the proximal RCA, 360 degree of calcium all around.
So definitely some of the areas, the improvement in, in a lumen area with the wheel looks impressive. But uh, the whole vessel is calcified. So uh, to, to, to really make some gist of this calcium, we may have to kind of <laughs> keep on delivering more and more. Here you can see the, uh, the you know, calcium giving way and then back to the guide. Next. So after that, the lumen expansion looked better, at least on the L scale, if you see, it looks better than previously. Next. Then we went ahead and uh, did a serial dilatation with the non-compliant balloon. Next, I think we, for want of time, we'll just jump and go to the last slide. So we stented and you know, you know, you can skip and go to the last, the last part. I think we put three stents, 3.5, 40, and you know, we stented right across. Next. Ah, I think this is the final shot. Okay. Uh, so, uh, you know, I want the expert panel to let me know how, if I have to do this case again, what better strategy I could have done and uh, what could have been a better alternative. Thank you very much. I hope you don't have to do this case again. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Uh, I would have probably started off with the 1.5 birth. That is the only thing I can defend. You are used to your guide line of extremely well, very effectively done, excellent imaging. Overall, uh, a case worthy of presentation. And uh, if you are wanted to go with a two, then you, your guide has to change. Uh, it's not easy to find an eight French guide that can uh, on your shelf. Then your guide liner becomes useless. Uh, so a lot of, lot of plus points and minus points in using a bigger uh, thing. I would have probably done with a 1.5 and be happy and then uh, rotor trip C would have been the way through because you got very thick calcium. Uh, I don't think I would have done anything differently from what you have done except for the size of the perk. Now let's have the opinion from Dr. Kapardi first. Yeah. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Mahesh. Uh, 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 first of all, I congrats to Dr. Manorkar for an excellent uh, uh, case done and presentation. As Dr. Mahesh already pointed out, it is an undersized bird. That is the main uh, uh, important uh, here. Having had taken 1.5 bird, maybe your requirements of uh, uh, guide extension may not be there. That is number one. And second, uh, the rota trips is the ideal because uh, as an extension of the previous uh, uh, discussion, nowadays the concept of rota max concept not only you have to debulk the calcium, you have to reduce the volume of the calcium by rota, that is number one, and then followed by increase the depth, uh, increase the compliance of the vessel by fracturing and pulverizing the deeper calcium of the vessel wall. These two are the important concepts so that the micro fracture may not be visible by OCT, but the ultimate resultant of uh, increase the minimal humidal area after uh, uh, plaque modification or ablation and increase minimal stent area after stent deployment. These are uh, indirect re reflectance of the adequate uh, ablation and decrease of the volume of calcium and uh, improve the compliance of the vessel wall after fracturing the deeper calcium. So this is the Rotamax concept where you excellently demonstrated. But as Dr. Mahesh told, it is just if you take 1.5, it may be you may uh, reduce the number of steps. That's the only thing. And only another important is for uh, calcium scoring, definitely OCT plays a major role and it scores over the IVAS because deeper calcium you won't see. So you can't uh, assess the score uh, accurately with the IVAS compared to the OCT. That's the only comments. Thank you, sir. Look, Manokar, you have the balloon first. What is IVL balloon? You have a distal teeth, then there is two millimeter blind spot, and that two millimeter balloon generates only four atmosphere. Then there is six millimeter run that generates 50 atmosphere plus your balloon atmosphere, that is four or six, so 54 or 56 atmosphere. Then again, there is another four millimeter, which generates only four millimeter of uh, pressure. So for both edges are having four millimeter. But six millimeter is the area where you're generating 54 uh, atmospheric pressure and that way small area. Whereas the rota generates a lot of pressure because the surface area is very small. 
So for superficial calcium, rota is excellent. For deeper calcium, you know, this IVL, which can break the medial calcifications in your case. And always on uh, fluoroscopy, the third artery looks bigger than actual the luminant diameter. So do not uh, go for a higher stent size, I would say like 3.5 millimeter. Go for three millimeter. All these modern stent can be made up to four millimeter square. So go for a smaller stent because there is smaller start thickness. It varies from the genre to genre. The different states have a different start thickness. The width is different. But if you go for a smaller stent, the delivery with those stent is better. And you have less metal. And you can always expand to your expected uh, your diameter. Now, if you have this kind of imaging that gives not only for your on-table outcome, patient-related outcome, the DAPT issue is very important. The DAPT can be reduced to one month if you have HBR cases. Now, as my, Dr. Mahesh was mentioning CTO, there is a new indication of CTO, not for CTO calcium as such. If you have a diagonal, 2.5 millimeter diagonal, if you put the IVL balloon in the diagonal, and if you place exactly six millimeter at the CTO uh, ostium, that CTO ostium calcium is broken. Now, Jonathan Hill has presented uh, these cases in, 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 uh, in CTO 2022, and he suggested, though it is costly, that even in CTO, this is one indication for CTO interventions. Very, very nicely done, but I would say, use all your gadgets, but every patient is different, but your case, tells us many, many, uh, uh, has many dimensions to discuss for one hour, two hours. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So the IVL, uh, IVL probably softened the CTO proximal plug. Professor Shivastav, you have been silent for too long. Uh, <laughs> you know, when Dr. Hajra is there, you know, there is nothing left for me to add. But uh, uh, there was a question of laser and we happened to do around eight to 10 cases of laser. Uh, so laser is a good uh, you know uh, mode here but only uh, thing uh, one should understand is whenever we are using laser we need some organic material between the calcium because that that how it you know causes a vaporization and causes a blast and that uh, uh, degrades the calcium so if it's circumferential calcium heavy load of calcium heavy jacket of calcium laser would not be a proper choice where they probably Rota would be the best, and second, uh, IVL would be the best, as uh, Dr. Hacha was explaining. Uh, so that is one place. If you have a moderate jacket of calcium, laser does very well, and it also works. I probably I feel that it works better than and safer than uh, Rota later. I keep Rota in the third place. First place would be either IVL or a laser. If uh, I have to take up a moderate calcium. Uh, Dr. Christian, uh, your comments, please, before we go to the next presenter. Yes, um, I just have one comment. We had excellent comments uh, before to this uh, very perfect case. But um, the comment which I would like to uh, make is, I like the idea of uh, choosing a smaller stand. But for this, we have to know exactly from all stands which we have on the on the shelf, um, how, how, um, how these stands are um, are developed. Sometimes we have companies with uh, only two stand platforms. Sometimes we have three, and there are also companies who have four stand platforms. Uh, this means that uh, a 3.5 stand can be the same stand as a 3.0 stand. It's the same platform. But then there are companies uh, where um, the 3.5 stand is completely a different um, stand uh, than the 3.0 stand. So we this is uh, what I'm telling also our fellows. Uh, they need to know exactly the dilatation uh, potential or um, um, there are different names from, from each company. Sometimes it is not, it's not written on the, on the boxes of the stands and this is a real problem. So we have tables uh, on our uh, wall in the cath lab to know exactly which stand have um, uh, what kind of uh, expansion potential. This is very important when we um, have the idea to choose a smaller or um, uh, yeah, a smaller stand. Stick the chart on the cath lab wall. So we'll go to Dr. Praveen and then we will have uh, Dr. Manohar, you are not going anywhere. Please be there. Yes. I'm yes. going to Dr. Praveen. Please uh, start. Praveen, if you're there, please start to share your screen and 
start the presentation. We have about 25 minutes uh, left, more than that. We've got about 45 minutes left, so there'll be a lot of discussion after Praveen's case. Thank you, sir. Uh, good evening. Actually, I'm embarrassed to present in such an audience. It was a very senior audience. Uh, thank you for allowing me, Dr. Mahesh, to present in front of such an elite audience. So I'll go ahead with my case. Uh, this is an 80-year-old male who is a diabetic hypertensive. He came with a recent onset of foot angina. He came with a uh, already done angio, which showed triple vessel disease, and uh, vessels look very calcified. And there was some hostile involvement of circumflex and a lady and the ramus was heavily calcified. Uh, since all vessels, he had a perfusion uh, scan done outside, which showed uh, uh, viable territory everywhere, and uh, ECG had shown no SCT changes acutely. So this we had taken up directly. We had di uh, chosen a femoral approach with the age French guide at the outset because we had expected uh, problems. So we had taken a uh, eight French guide at the outset and wired all three vessels and did a pre dilatation of LAD. This is to enable the IVS. So initially we did a, uh, a balloon pre dilatation. Um, there was no much calcium in LAD. The least calcium was in LAD. So we pre dilated that, uh, tried pre dilating the LAD. Then went ahead and uh, tried predilating the proximal part of ramus. Further, the balloon would not go beyond this, and the dilatation achieved was very low. Dilatation achieved was very low, and this was a. Uh, uh, I was showing calcium. Maximum calcium was in uh, ramus, which showed an arc of calcium of more than 270 degree arc of calcium. Ramus also had heavy calcium. Ramus had calcium throughout, and the lumen was very narrow. The IVS no, was not passing beyond a certain point. There was an acute bend in the ramus, where beyond which IVS could not pass on. And this was the ramus pre dilatation, which was done with an acute force balloon initially. So we tried with an acute force balloon, and this also did not produce much of a uh, dilatation as we wanted. And this was a pre dilatation going on. This was the ramus, and there were two branches of ramus, and both we tried and LCX ostium, which had heavy calcium, was also pre dilated. Then this was an IVL balloon. It's a 3 into 12 IVL balloon, which was placed in the place where Equiforce was uh, done with a 2.5. And it's a 3 into 12 IVL balloon. And IVL balloon could pass. Post IVL, the vessel seemed to look uh, much bigger than it was previously. And so we could go ahead with the Ramus pre dilatation after this. And this was the IVL being done. And with IVL, we could track it much distally across the bend also. So probably with Rota, we could not, we would not uh, have negotiated this bend in the ramus. And IVL balloon somehow passed with difficulty. So somehow, luckily, our IVL balloon did not break. So we gave four uh, ramus pul pulses in the ramus with the C2 balloon. And this was the IVL being done. And we used the rest of the pulses available to LAD and also Austral LCX, which had heavy calcium. So we finished the case uh, with this, the lithotripsy was over, but uh, then we did with, the problem was there was a trifurcation. So we went ahead with the trifurcations. Uh, initially we considered it as a bifurcation uh, and uh, did an LAD LCX bifurcation sending. So this was the LAD LCX wiring and redilated and the bifurcation standing was done with post dilatation. Uh, this was a classical kilo. And we standard the LED with a 3 into 38 and LCX with a 3.5 into 38 a balloon. And post dilatation was done. This was the end result. And then we wanted to uh, go ahead with the ramus plasty. So ramus plasty, what was done was just a, a distance to the bifurcation. Uh, we wired the ramus just distal to the bifurcation so ramus was wired this is the lcx wire the post dilatation sks of uh, led lcx and this was ramus was wired just beyond the bifurcation and passed the balloon and dilated that area so this was a post pre dilatation ramus led bifurcation and a stent could, could uh, negotiate through the ramus and then uh, wired the LED through the lumen. 
and then completed the bifurcation of the LED ramas. A balloon was passed distally, and then this is the previous shot. And ramus plasty ramus plasty was completed with LED ramus bifurcation. And after the uh, ramus was tended, this was ramus tend. Ramus tend could pass very easily uh, post IVL. If IVL was not there, I don't think we could have completed this ramus plasty. And this was the LED uh, ramus uh, bifurcation balloon dilatation. And this is the end result that we initially got. But then we had problems. Just immediate post uh, LED ramus, this was the result. Ramus was totally closed off and there was thrombus in the LED also. So we did a thrombus aspiration from the LED using a, a eliminate catheter. And then uh, again, pre-dilated the LED ramus area. This is a post pre-dilatation result. And then uh, we were about to come off, but then found that just be, when we, we, we were, then we went ahead with thrombus, the uh, aspiration from the LED also. And this was uh, kissing balloon dilatation at LED ramus bifurcation. So after the LED ramus bifurcation, what had happened was there was a thrombus in the LCX also. Once we finished the bifurcation, this was a post ending and LCX uh, calcium had partly gone. But then we found that at the last, there was a th thrombus in the LCX ostium. So we again wired the LCM, uh, LCX after putting two balloons in the LED and ramus. And then finally, we went ahead with the triple balloon simultaneous uh, post dilatation after thrombus aspiration from the circumflex. So this was the final result. So we got a final result like this after the uh, uh, three with three balloon dilatation. Thank you. Super case, Dr. Ravin. Uh, two things. One is the triple kissing is now nowadays called trissing. It's already been labeled. So everything has got a label these days. And uh, why did the thrombus come is the mystery which we need to solve. So I request uh, Professor where is he gone? The professor from uh, I think he's missing. Okay, let's go to um, ah, yeah. So, professor Momenizman, please your comments and your thing. I miss, suddenly missed you. <laughs> this is a really challenging case, especially uh, putting a stent in a, a tree vessel and after that the, if there is any thrombus really it's a nightmare but very nicely tackled that uh, things and uh, one thing I am uh, wondering why there is a uh, uh, thrombus could it be because of uh, inadequate uh, antiplatelet therapy or heparin whatever it is there, there should be uh, some form of antiplatelet uh, 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 reason for this thrombus. Others, I have not, not seen much of a dissection or anything that initiate the scale shape. One more thing is that uh, was it necessary to to handle this uh, ramus? <laughs> because putting a stent in a, this, uh, the chances of resistance is definitely to be high in a place uh, with a uh, with a, a left dominant system. So, okay, things ultimately uh, came out successfully, but it needs a long-term uh, follow-up of this patient about the future. Uh, yeah, Still, had, uh, I congratulate. Two years, yeah, two years later, we had done an angio and it looked uh, quite okay. Oh, yes, congratulations. <laughs> yeah. Dr. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. person who does all these things. Oh, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, this, uh, if you go to the descent reverse uh, guidelines, uh, triple vessel disease, they have downgraded 2B, surgery has been downgraded 2B, and it is a dogma that you have to do a complete devascularization in all cases. I will agree with Professor Mamanujjaman that chasing ramas was a red herring in this case, and uh, this ramas is just like a vestigial organ, uh, like an appendix in human heart. Most of the CBG people, I mean, surgeons, they don't uh, bother about the large ramas until and unless. It's supplying a large area of myocardium through collaterals. But if it is a natural ramus, it's unlike your diagonal, it's unlike your large vein, which is going up to the apex. 
so you have to understand what ramas is doing in a human heart so that was a kind of red, red herring nowadays we use a cangrelor we use a very potent antiplatelet amazing now why there is a thrombus uh, uh, most probably there was some issue with your antiplatelet antithrombotic but if you have done nicely on antithrombotic and antiplatelet or a guide uh, uh, throwing a thrombus inside your coronary artery why it was ping ponging like one artery to another artery so there may be some thrombus at the origin or uh, maybe in the left main near the bifurcation which was actually getting compressed and moving from one zone to another zone that's my take but ultimate uh, proof of pudding is eating if the patient is doing well after 2 years or 20 years who cares <laughs> Uh, one addition, yeah, sir. Yes, sir. One addition was that we had actually done a clopidogrel uh, rotem. So it was found that actually he was resistant to clopidogrel. We didn't know we had loaded with clopidogrel at the procedure time. So um, uh, post procedure, when this has mm -hmm. happened, when we checked that there was clopidogrel resistance, at least by clopidogrel rotem. So we had later placed the patient on Brillinta with the loading. We had already loaded post procedure because of thrombus with the ticagrelor. Or but uh, we were using clopidogrel initially when the case began probably we don't know i'm not very sure of this yeah fantastic information if you have done that facility is available uh, the taylor pci trial has told us that a genetic testing and clopidogrel resistance with 30% in asian population unlike uh, german or uh, your uh, christians country or american which is much more prevalent in asia 30% and you uh, that could be another chance phenomena i mean you cannot blame clopidogrel all the time just because you have clopidogrel yes yeah. even in clopidogrel resistance patient you have other mechanisms <laughs> you not give heparin if you have thrombus so those are uh, things are important to understand but it could be one of the factor as you have candidly mentioned and you have admitted that it could be clopidogrel resistance that's why we are moving towards you are uh, i mean better antiplatelet strong, stronger antiplatelet or cangrel or it is available now in our country if you see that patient has developed thrombus you can immediately switch on to cangrel or if you have cangrel or on your board for the timing you are covered this cangrel or infusion bolus plus infusion can be life saving like gp2 with three receptors are not easily available because it's out of the uh, out of the globe because of its uh, huge complications of bleeding now the new thing is your uh, cangrel lock so if you have issue with cangrel after after clopidogrel loading yes yes after clopidogrel loading yes you can use cangrel lock followed yes, by yes. followed by your ticagrelor up or presuggel after half an hour or that we can but once loaded with clopidogrel then to start this is the ideal situation of using iv cangrel lock if you have thought of clopidogrel resistance because you have maintained ac more than 300 your guiding is not showing thrombus you have imaging there is no thrombus there so no reason why there will be thrombus and you are blaming it on clopidogrel so be it on cangrel or if that is available in our country yes. one 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 uh, small uh, sharing by experience uh, especially there the uh, the issue of uh, clopidogrel resistant i personally just to see the effect of this Uh, uh, resistant on the clinical perspective. Personally, I have not seen much of uh, correlation between these two. I have done deliberately to see these things in about one thousand patient, giving much of uh, uh, financial benefit to the company to see what is the actually uh, impact on clinical background aspect. But uh, the chances, as Hazza said, that thirty percent. Yes, and if you compare. both aspirin and clopidogrel sometimes it goes much more so but in that ratio we don't find that much of thrombus or uh, anything uh, even if the patient is resistant to aspirin or clopidogrel so I, i don't think it has got any clinical implication especially if you say the resistance of aspirin and clopidogrel might be something else that is actually protecting in a patient even they are Are resistant to aspirin or clopidogrel or even both. That is my experience. I'm just sharing with you. I agree with you. Like your observation, first few hours or few minutes or few seconds of intervention, the clopidogrel or antiplatelets are not that important. Important is heparin. 
once you take this wire out of the coronary you're guiding out of the coronary perhaps this is the time for your antiplatelet to have actions many times we uh, we we load these patients after doing an angioplasty like primary angioplasty so there is no benefit of pre treatment of clopidogrel or pre treatment of antiplatelet loadings and you are absolutely right that it is may not be that important but you know if that had not happened on the table it suppose it would happen afterwards in the icu or at home this patient would have been dead yeah so that is the biggest implication so knowing the fact that it has happened on the table so it's better to change an antiplatelet because this man would have gone home with on clopidogrel and if he has a resistance and would have developed stent thrombosis would have been dead at home so better it happened on the table like bivalvodin stent thrombosis happens on the table rather than heparin stent thrombosis so death rate in bivalvodin is much less than heparin in stent thrombosis just because of this fact but these act can be corrected on the table yes dr hazra commonest factors of stent thrombosis especially in this given case one is a sister's defect that is whether heparin inadequate dose sister saline sometimes we have seen and second one is uh, as you told rather than technical factor not maintaining the adequate acid because of prolonged procedure or inadequate dose of it these are the commonest factors for this type of the events which he described even the reuse baru yes. dr sachin your comments please um I like the idea um, of um, using imaging also to decide uh, how many pulses of uh, shock wave um, we should uh, apply uh, to specific lesions if we have uh, to do multivessel disease uh, shock wave therapy. This was quite interesting, very well uh, presented. And then I have a question: um, If um, you have uh, done at the end a final pot, because this is uh, if you have a left main intervention. Um, yeah. very important especially when you um that multi vessel dilatation uh, this is yeah it should I completed with the final part okay perfect thank you and in this case if i would have um, a stent thrombosis uh, in a patient on the table i would uh, first of course check the act and it should be more than 250 and then i would give uh, the gp to b free a we have integralin in our laboratories so this um, i use uh, quite often also in uh, in acute coronary syndromes um you can give it as a bolus and then later on if you have a huge thrombus load then as an uh, iv uh, infusion um yeah but very nice case and congratulations uh, dr rafai has just joined us rafai your comments on ivl in general uh good evening yes. good evening sorry i was a bit late you know just a couple of comments on stent thrombosis i mean this is something we always see in every meeting you go there's definitely at least one case presentation of acute stent thrombosis and i i keep telling this uh, to that that every 200 250 cases you do you will get acute stent thrombosis on the table there are various factors in that i mean this is beyond our control starting from the who takes the heparin out whether it's a one in one ratio of heparin or sometimes or most of the centers use 1 ml of 5000 heparin so the errors are so dramatic in those kind of dilution of the heparin we use so i tend to use a pd well what they call it is a pediatric heparin which is 1 1 ml is has got 1000 units where the accuracy of the heparin in few injections you give is much more clearer but nevertheless as somebody mentioned most of the times the heparin is been drawn by the nurses and is given to you as heparin but not necessarily it can be sometimes a mixture of ntg or something saline or so we always see this case i mean the more you case the more you do the more uh, you do see this on and off every 250 cases or 300 cases you'll come across i think the most important thing is we need to understand how to deal with it when it happens i'm sure uh, all of us know how to deal with that i'm coming to this point of bivalvuridin as somebody mentioned about the use of bivalvuridin i think i did a lot of extensive study comparing bivalvuridin with uh, gpt 2b3 inhibitors in the real world after the horizons ami trial came which is one of the positive trials of bivalvuridin and i think actually if you look at the data it's not actually acute stent thrombosis within the on the table the risk of stent thrombosis in the first 24 hours is high in bivalvuridin group and if you look at it it's not exactly within the first 2 3 hours it's more probably within the first 24 hours compared to the glycoprotein 2b3 arm which is the competitor arm so what we tend to say is well if you have a stent thrombosis you might as well have in the hospital when you're in the hospital rather than that but nevertheless the bivalvuridin got its 
uh, uh, like you know wrong end when we hit PPCI came and everybody thought that it's more expensive form of heparin than anything else. So I think that that's an important point to to be taken into account. Uh, in terms of IVL, I, well, I mean every every modality has got its positive and negative point when it comes to IVL. I also had difficulties sometimes crossing the IVL. Well, sometimes some people don't call IVL as a balloon. It's a device on its own. So um, they say that you should actually call this IVL device and not an IVL balloon. And I do have some difficulties crossing the circumflex lesions, particularly when you use for the LAD and go to circumflex. So I had a bifurcation case where I had wires in both LAD and circ. I thought I'll finish the LAD with the IVL balloon and then move to circumflex the same balloon because both branches have a heavy chunk of calcium. What I found was if you use the IVL balloon in the LAD and then I use 40 pulses and I thought I'll use another 40 pulses in the circumflex, but I tried to track the balloon through the two wires crisscrossing on the circumflex, I damage the balloon. So one tip I always say is if you have a difficult lesion or difficult crossing, use the IVL balloon in that particular lesion and then come to the straightforward arteries. Uh, but yes, it's an amazing technology and it that created, created, given a lot of uh, comfort zone for the operators to do heavily calcified arteries compared to the other modalities like rotablation. Thank you. Dr. Rafa is a senior consultant interventional cardiologist from Apollo Main Hospital. Dr. Manokar, you have to give your comments. Uh, uh, that is true, sir. Uh, in fact, uh, what Dr. Rafai said is this dilution of heparin is something uh, and especially across hospitals, we always face problems. So every hospital has its own funny uh, way of procuring heparin brands and all those things. Uh, regarding the uh, in general IVL and this thing, I had some, uh, you know, some doubts I thought I'll ask uh, to the esteemed panel. Uh, how often uh, uh, we have not IVL in a setting of a say calcium nodule in in a coronary uh, because generally all the algorithms do not give great uh, you know uh, uh, chance that rotablation or IVL will have success in a calcified nodule. So uh, you know what has been the experienced uh, experience with among the panelists on calcium nodule if at all you come across in an, in an imaging with calcium uh, for, uh, you know, what strategy would be ideal in such a situation? My personal experience, excellent. I had a left main calcium nodule uh, that will be presenting in tomorrow's meeting. Fabulous. I and after the two runs of IVL, one into the circumflex and one into the uh, LED from the left main, when we took a shot, uh, the, there was no evidence of even calcium anywhere. Forget about nodule. So my experiences are three cases only with uh, pure nodules only. They have been done excellently well. Look, look there are two, two types of uh, uh, nodule, CAN, from Renu Virmani's uh, autopsy study. One is basically two types. One is a thick cap, uh, uh, this fibrous cap, uh, calcium nodule. And as a thin cap, like ACS uh, calcium nodule. If it is LCS like calcium nodule, this IVL will work, definitely will work. I have experience of around 55 cases of IVL. Many, I mean, four or five cases I had this kind of calcium, it worked. But sometimes you have to use additional uh, device like opium sometimes. But if you have a very thick cap, which can imaging tell you that thick cap uh, calcium nodule, large nodule, in especially large artery like left main, then we do not have a 4.5 or 5 millimeter IVL. Then there is a lot of space, uh, a gap between your uh, the energy and the module itself. But if it is three millimeter fit with a three millimeter IVL, even in calcium nodule, it will work. Only point is you have to invest all your energy in the calcium nodule. You cannot use, uh, I mean, this 80 pulses, like two pulses for the nodule, two pulses for your wife, two pulses for your children. I mean, uh, two pulses for your mother. So you have to invest on the calcium nodule. So it is value for money and not value for money for calcium nodule. Sometimes you have used two, two, two IVL balloon for calcium nodule. So it works because there's a no hope case. What else will work? The laser will not work. The rota will not work. You have to use very 2.2 uh, or 2.5 rota bar for a large calcium nodule sitting on the left pane and large LED. So better to be on the IVL side rather than on choosing very high uh, bar, uh, high uh, uh, device size of rotor. There has been a solution to that also. Use a 3mm IVL balloon and use another 3mm balloon parallel to that. 
make sure that the IVL balloon is on the side of the nodule. And after expanding both the balloons to maybe five millimeter, you can go ahead and deliver the shocks. And uh, this time, you will, the IVL shocks will get uh, definitely delivered onto the uh, onto the nodule, provided your IVL balloons on the nodular side. I heard a case presentation. I think that's where Dr. Colombo somebody on this topic. Dr. Christian, your views on this? I completely agree. IVL is working to treat nodules. But uh, in most cases, uh, you have to know that you would need more pulses. I'm convinced about this. Uh, Dr. Mahesh, actually, uh, if the wire bias is there, definitely rota will ablate the nodule. And of course, as we told that IVL, you have to exhaust more number of pulses for fracturing nodules. That is my experience. Dr. Rafai, your experience, your comments? Um, yeah, I think it well, depends on the nodule, the location of the nodule. As you said, the left main nodule is always going to be a tough one because of the size of the artery. Uh, but sometimes I also feel that we do go overboard in left main nodules. Uh, I think I stick to the same point that if my uh, um, uh, luminal area is not compromised, I think we should leave it alone. So I have one or two cases where you see the projection nodule into the uh, lumen, um, and I know that it's going to be tough doing it. But if I have a luminal area which is satisfactory, which sometimes can happen, I'm not saying in all those cases, if it's anything above six, you can always say that, well, listen, there is a nodule, but there is a luminal area which clearly suggests that we don't need to do anything about it. This how commonly happens when you have a heavy chunk of calcium in the LAD circumflex, and there's a nodule sitting in the left main. So that is a balance you have to accept that going to how far, I mean, as somebody said, we may end up being two uh, balloons to IVL devices or balloons to use for uh, cracking that nodule, or you might rather do it, leave it alone if your uh, luminal area is not compromised that much. So there's a question from the audience, which says, Dr. Vijayan, we know Vijayan has asked, how do you negotiate bends, especially circumflex and angular lesions? Uh, Dr. Rafai and Dr. Christian, you can answer please. Your, your, your way of tackling. Also, um, uh, sorry, Dr. Christian, if, if uh, um, yeah, so the, the commonest way I normally use is if you have a bend, if you want to get your devices down, as we always do, I tend to use my microcatheters, or sorry, my um, uh, uh, mother and child catheters to jump up to the ostium of the bend artery, wherever you want, and take the device safely, because I, I burnt my fingers trying to negotiate the balloon into the circumflex and there is a, a, a rupture of the balloon. So uh, if you have any doubt, you can always get, get your um, uh, mother and child catheter, whichever device you have, get all the way in the location where you want to deliver the pulses and take the device there and then pull it and you can do it. Dr. Christian. Exactly. Yeah. No further comments. I completely agree. Dr. Manoka. Um, sir, I personally feel yeah, this uh, grand slam wire, no? so its tip is very soft. So once you are doing a circ intervention and you know there is a little bit of tricky part, I think uh, up front we, if we try to use it, I think a lot of this uh, turns and uh, you know curves with the circumflex becomes a little easier. So I have started using them far earlier than before. Before I used to use them once I failed. Nowadays, what I do is I try to put the wire in the circumflex OM or somewhere and then get a grand slam wire to go parallelly and make sure that the grand slam wire stays with me right through the procedure. And that makes it far easier for many of these crossings and change of the, you know, hardware and stuff like this. Grand slam wire tends to have a good rock-like bias in one direction. Dr. Momentsman, you are hiding. Actually, yeah. I'm listening. I'm yeah. listening all these ticks yeah. and tips. Yeah. You, to pass, you, come in, you get no, no, the award for the best shot practice. of the evening. Anything, any device, uh, uh, if you cannot cross it, uh, mother and child catheter or Godzilla is a good device. And as a grand slam, it's like the all-star wire. It's an extra support wire that, that can make the uh, device tra track very easily. Moreover, uh, it is something like a body wire. Uh, um, well, there are facilities that you can get to track any uh, curve or bend, uh, <coughs> where the usual uh, maneuver may not help. These two techniques is enough to to proceed uh, uh, to track the device in the desired location. Thank you. Final comments with Dr. Christian, then we'll wind up. Final 
comments about uh, the situation of a complex circumflex or final comments about the, uh, what, what the we meeting? Are? meeting. <laughs> so we are, we are uh, almost done, yeah? So I would like, first of all, to thank uh, the, the companies, uh, you as a moderator, all the chair um, persons and the panelists. I guess it was an excellent meeting and um, it would be great to get some um, feedback from the, from the masterclass participants. For me, it was a very uh, well experienced and uh, I hope to see you um, in the future. Uh, come to Switzerland, it's a very nice um, country. If uh, from the masterclass participants, someone would like to spend a fellowship in, in, in the Grünzig Labs, uh, please um, send me your, your CV. Uh, we have always uh, foreign uh, fellows uh, in our hospital. So thank you very much um, and, and uh, greetings from uh, Germany. Thank you. Uh, thank we you. had 360 participants who are uh, in, the, in the show. Atul, would you like to conclude, please? And thank Transdimina for this opportunity. Great, great. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Dr. Mahesh and wonderful session and wonderful moderation as usual, sir. So uh, kudos to that and I really appreciate presence of Dr. Taparthi, Dr. Dr. Christian Templin and Dr. Hazra as chair and, and not to forget Dr. No Momenu Zaman who has joined us from Bangladesh and given his, uh, his, his very precious time to us. And also all the presenters, Dr. Praveen, Dr. Manokar and others who, who were also presenting. And also thanks a lot, Ref Dr. Rafai for joining in and, and giving as usual great suggestions at the very end. So thanks a lot team. Uh, Translumina is always committed to, to come up with such sort of programs uh, more often than not. And, and we are eagerly awaiting to continue this Calcium Masterclass series. So thanks a lot for, for trusting the device, trusting the company and, and we'll go along with it together. Thanks a lot, everyone. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Have a nice evening. Bye. 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 Bye.